Our next session is going to begin shortly here. Neuropeptides, neurotransmitters, genes, and compassion. Uh, our moderator today is uh, my friend Cliff Sarin, who is an associate research scientist at the Center for Mind and Brain and also the Mind Institute at the University of California, Davis. He has had a long-standing history, uh, or interest, I should say, and history, I guess, in uh, the study of the effects of meditation on the brain and behavior. He was involved with the earliest studies of researching uh, Tibetan monks, of which His Holiness the Dalai Lama was involved, and has also been a faculty member at the Mind and Life Summer Research Institute. And most recently, uh, he has been the principal investigator for the Shamatha Project, which is the long uh, longitudinal study of the effects of the practice of Shamatha, and it's uh, also uh, on um, cultivating the four immeasurables. So, uh, Cliff, if you will, thank you very much, and please give a hand to Cliff, Sarah. Thanks for making it back from lunch to be here. You're in for a treat. We've been talking about the emergence of compassion as a multifaceted, inter individual expression. We've seen how training it can be as innocuous as synchronizing two people tapping their fingers and as profound as a move to recovery from profound trauma. We've been speaking at the level of some physiology, some neural activity, much interpersonal and psychological change, but we haven't really delved into the focus of this session, which is the cellular, molecular, gene expression level changes. Steve Cole, one of our speakers has, at lunch yesterday, was speaking of the innate, if you will, compassion of cells for each other. They need to know how they're doing. There's an extraordinarily complex system of communication that changes the function of cells as a function of their local conditions that allows us to heal from injury, that allows us to maintain homeostasis. So this morning, or this afternoon rather, it feels perpetually like dawn if we can quote Thoreau and I can recover from a slip gently uh, in this room. We're going to begin from the metaphor of the, that Jimpa talked about of the love of a mother for her child with Sue Carter who's going to talk about uh, oxytocin the classically, colloquially called mothering hormone. And she will talk about affiliative systems and their adaptive nature for healing. We're going to move on to Ferdos Debar speaking about the benefits of acute stress. Stress as a word sometimes has a pejorative gloss but it's really important to understand how highly adaptive our stress response can be if it is short-lived. He will set up Serena Rodriguez Saturn's presentation on how individual differences can affect our neurohormonal response to stress and also promote the uh, beneficial effects of being pro-social and altruistic and compassionate. We will then dive down uh, to another level uh, of uh, biological organization and look at uh, changes in gene expression and uh, how the genome interacts with the environment from psychology to gene expression in Steve Cole's talk. Since we've talked about interventions at very high levels, both explicit and implicit, we're going to change the level of an intervention to the gene, molecular, cellular level. And Joel Finkelstein will finish uh, this session, uh, a formal presentation, talking about 
uh, extraordinary, another uh, wild science future uh, application of tremendous importance, which is optogenetic control of uh, single cells in behaving awake organisms, in behaviors that are relevant to compassion. So without further ado, I was much taken with Dan's suggestion that speakers introduce themselves. And so on short notice, we've included that uh, in uh, the uh, requirements of the speaker's time today. Thank you. Great pleasure to be here. I want to thank the people who've invited me, including Jim, Cliff, and all of you who I've met, some of you for the first time. Anyway, as I said, it is a pleasure to be here. I have a new address since the program was uh, submitted. Both Steve Porges and I work for the Research Triangle Institute International in North Carolina. And that's part of the, my story. So most of you know by now, because Steve's talked about it, that Steve and I have been married for a little while, a couple of decades. In fact, so long that we have these two grown children. Eric, who's a social neuroscientist working with Jean de Cidi at the University of Chicago. How about that? And the other one, Seth, who's on the left on that screen, is a journalist. These people are the ones who really got me where I am today in terms of both support, which Steve gave me all along to be allowed to do science. It's, I believe it's a privilege. And my curly-headed son, who was born almost exactly 32 years ago this week, who introduced me to oxytocin in many ways, including um, <laughs> the fact that it was given to me in order to assure that he would be born within 24 hours. Um, that was not in my plan. I mean, women still have these, they now call them birth plans. I just said, no drugs, no drugs. Well, I still wound up having to choose between drugs or being, I, I looked something like a watermelon. At that point, he was a big baby. And I remember thinking, they're going to slice me open like a watermelon if I don't take this molecule. At the time, I asked, and I have continued to ask for 32 years, what in the world was done to my child? What did you do? I mean, this stuff was given to me, but I was pretty confident, and I still am, that it got to the baby. And now, of course, you may find as many as 95% of births being uh, Pitocin is induced or augmented and this if I could I would just talk about that the whole time But I'm not going to I'm going to talk about compassion I promise that's why we're here and I do want to thank uh, the collaborators who brought uh, Who've allowed me to present work these are people who've worked with me in my lab over the years including Steve who's brought us to a whole new kind of thinking about oxytocin and its mechanisms the scientific attempts to understand compassion bring up a lot of questions. For example, what's compassion? Well, we've pretty much covered that, and we, it's a very obvious to me that almost everyone here has a slightly different take on this. Um, but then another question is, once a compassionate experience starts, does the, mat, does the object of the compassion really matter? And I'm not sure it does. I think it may be, a phys once it becomes a physiological shift, it may just sort of have a cascade. Is compassion similar in form and function to other forms of positive social behaviors? And certainly Barbara made that point this morning. I think so. I think many aspects of this are going to turn out to be almost the same story with some differences which are going to unfortunately be beyond the scope of this presentation, but are something I'd like to have dialogue about later. Can we use the analysis of other kinds of sociality, including parental behavior, to help us understand the mechanisms for positive social interactions? And the answer is there, I'm pretty sure, yes. And of course, my favorite hormone, oxytocin, which I guess it wasn't my favorite on July 27, 1980, but I've gotten very attached to it and very interested in it. 
And I wondered, and I still wonder, whether perhaps just focusing on oxytocin itself may give us a new point of view on the value of positive social behaviors in human health. It's a, it turns out to be an incredibly broad a molecule with incredibly broad functions. And so I think, and this is an influenced very much by something Stephanie Brown did years ago, which was to show that it was better to give than receive. I know, I know that's biblical too, but I mean, you know, we all start in modern times. So how can this, how can we take our knowledge of the nervous system and especially the chemistry and start to think about the science of compassion? Does knowledge of the chemistry of social behavior more generally help us to understand both giving and receiving and also the protective and healing effects? So the what is compassion story question, of course, I borrowed this from the Wikipedia site, which, which quotes Buddha, um, but I'm not a scholar, and I wish I were. Um, however, I think that we're all talking about something in which we feel for others. And we want to know, as I mentioned, whether there might be common elements in the neurobiology of social behavior, social engagement, and love. And Barbara set this up very nicely. And those associated with compassion, the answer is probably yes. Are the behavioral and neural elements that make up compassion unique to humans? Here, the answer is some may be, but most are probably not. Because we're using so many of the elements in the human nervous system that we've inherited from our ancestors. Abstract concepts like compassion are probably most easily understood, at least for me, in the context of what they do for a living, which includes survival and reproduction. Um, when I started this work, oxytocin was totally seen as a reproductive hormone. I think really it's a survival hormone, it's a resilience hormone, it's a hormone that allows us to adapt to a whole series of events. Now, the, the background story here is simple. Most living organisms cannot survive or reproduce alone. And as Steve pointed out, Steve Porges, the mammalian nervous system is designed in some way, and this comes from Myron Hofer's ideas originally, to work in a social environment. Social behavior is necessary, it's essential, for physiological and behavioral homeostasis. Hofer called that hidden regulators. You can see this really just in pictures. I think that the pictures of, of at least maternal infant interactions like this show us that these social bonds, these things that we're so interested in, are not limited to humans. And other people have already said this, and this has been my, my sort of perspective for quite a long time, that the evolutionary prototype for positive social interactions is probably the parent-child interaction, probably the mother-child interaction initially. And you can see this so beautifully. I mean, everybody, every species is kind of doing this the same way. Even an asocial orangutan has this, this sort of somehow simpatico relationship with the baby. But of course, the alloparenting is not limited to mothers, and it's not limited to biological offspring or relatives, unless this is Obama's love child, and we're pretty sure it's not. Um, so, and of course, not everyone is prepared. This kind of speaks for itself, right? I'm not making a comment, it's not political, it's just a picture. But in general, we have to sort of assume that some of us need hormonal help. Now, so is the compassion that we have for non-relatives, the non-familial passion, is that some compassion, somehow based on the same neurobiological substrates that are necessary for the parent-child interaction? And again, I think the answer is probably yes. Most of my work, a lot of it, start, I started studying lactation, and we found, and I was collaborating at that time with a wonderful woman named Marty Altimus, who's at Cornell, psychiatrist, and she helped me, and we did these hum, human studies, sort of clinical studies, 
of the maternal child interactions and the effects of lactation. We really, we started, we were going to do both the mother and the child. We wound up mostly studying the mother because it's easier. And it was a pretty good model, I think, for oxytocin's effects. We used as our controls both women who were not lactating but had given birth and non and cycling women who didn't have babies. And there were profound differences. I won't go through them today except to say that lactation allows the mother to manage stress more effectively. And I knew that, I sort of knew that from personal experience. To add to the side story of where am I coming from, I grew up in the Ozarks. I grew up without medicine. I grew up without drugs. I was very upset to get that oxytocin, but the last thing I was going to do was not nurse my baby because as far as I could see, there was only one food for humans, and that was human milk for human babies. And I got, in fact, I was such a radical about this that I, I no longer even talk about it because it gets other people uncomfortable, but I, I was obsessed. I really was obsessed. I think that also is oxyt one of the little things that oxytocin can do. It sort of focuses your attention and on the baby. Um, and so lactation turns out to be a physiological buffer, I believe, from the state of pregnancy to the postpartum period, and oxytocin's in the middle of that story. What is it? It's a neuropeptide. It's made primarily in the nervous system, and it's central, and now been shown by lots of people, to be central to the biology of social behavior, social bonds, social support, sexual behavior, all kinds of important things. Now, this peptide, of course, had a bad name in the beginning because it was thought to be a female reproductive hormone of no consequence to men. And I read this in textbooks, medical textbooks, no known function in men. And really, that kept it off, off of the scientific agenda for a long time. But it's not true. In fact, it's, there is a course of reproductive peace, but it's only part of the story. It is made mainly in the brain, and that makes it a bit different from most of the other hormones we study, or I've studied. It's released at the posterior pituitary, but it's also released within the nervous system. It can affect various behaviors. It can also affect profoundly the autonomic nervous system. And Steve and I have some lovely data. We won't, won't have time to tell the whole story. And it's part of the immune system. In fact, I think oxytocin and the immune system are really, they, I mean, we just named them differently. We gave them sort of disciplinary differences, but they're really all part of that same adaptive system that protects and heals in the face of challenge. Some of the things that oxytocin's been shown to do with just within the last couple of years are mind-blowing. It can, in animal models, heal burns. It can heal after a heart attack. It can reduce or protect against osteoporosis. It can protect against intestinal bowel diseases, stroke. The amount of a stroke is half as big in animals that have been treated with oxytocin or placed in a social environment. So isolation gives you a paradigm of all kinds of disorders. Oxytocin seems to kind of put them back together. And more recently, and things I've had the really the wonderful opportunity to work on, we've been working on so-called disorders, and I don't even like these titles, but things that are called anxiety, depression, autism, and schizophrenia, where there are oxytocin stories. I think the bottom line is that oxytocin is a powerful anti-inflammatory and an antioxidant. And added to this ability to regulate the autonomic nervous system, it's doing all kinds of amazing things. Now, it doesn't act alone. It has a sibling hormone called vasopressin. These two evolve from the same molecule. They interact with each other and each other's receptors. They're a nightmare from a scientific purity point of view to pull apart oxytocin and vasopressin because they're really the same systems. Um, but the, the bottom line, again, it influenced very much by Steve Porges, is that oxytocin is probably necessary for immobilization without fear. These are Steve's my, his words back in the 1990s. They are holding up very well in terms of what we're finding. Vasopressin seems more important to mobilizations and active adaptive responses. Uh, the capacity to deal in the face of fear and anxiety. 
Now, I won't go through this slide in detail except to support again what Steve said, which is that mammals evolved from a reptil reptilian ancestor. There were already versions of oxytocin and vasopressin in place, but when we got to the mammals, two mammals, especially placental mammals, we started to see these functions kind of falling out in two patterns. Vasopressin being involved in defensive and territorial behaviors, vigilance, mobilization, active responses, and probably what Steve has called neuroception. Oxytocin on the other side being involved in what we humans call love, sharing, relaxation, the immobilization without fear, passive responses in some cases, an incredibly powerful healing compound. Compassion is probably specific to mammals, and we can hypothesize that, that what we're calling compassion is really an evolved dance between oxytocin and vasopressin. Vasopressin sort of pulling us toward taking care of ourselves, but also our families, territoriality, and so forth. Oxytocin more involved in allowing the very specific behaviors that are necessary for social engagement, love, empathy, compassion, and then relaxing and being able to heal in the presence of others. Vasopressin, a little bit on the opposite side. Oxytocin, as you may know, is being given extensively and intranasally in studies. Some of these are coming out not in a simple way. Uh, there's so much hype, I, would, I don't even want to discuss it, but it, there, the concept of trust as defined in computer games has been by, mostly through the work of Marcus Heinrichs and Ernst Fair, has been shown, there's been shown to be an effect of oxytocin. There are quite a few studies, and they're not as simple as I'll make them sound today, that suggest that intranasal oxytocin can increase the tendency to socially engage, and during in social engagement, increase the ability to read the emotions of others, especially in the eyes or pictures of eyes even. So we have here a kind of a very interesting molecule that, to my ear, listening for the last day or half day, day and a half, seems to be very similar to the story that we're hearing in this room. Expressing compassion can heal. We can get the benefits of helping others. And there's increasing evidence that oxytocin is a part of that healing power of positive social interactions. I often ask what oxytocin is, and I try, to the extent that I can, to make a simple story. I think, to some extent, it's a physiological metaphor for safety. It's also the tip of a very complex physiological iceberg of interactive systems with effects throughout the entire body, most of which we probably don't even know. They're only now being recognized. Now, the second part of my personal story is that I was living Steve and I were faculty members at the University of Illinois. One of my colleagues there, Lowell Getz, asked me to help him study prairie voles. He was pretty sure, based on field work, that these animals were living in pairs and defending territories around a family unit, a monogamous pair. We brought them into the laboratory. Sure enough, they really were doing a lot of these things. This monogamy that they were showing was social monogamy. It wasn't sexual monogamy, and that's another story. But these animals had incredibly high levels of social contact, dependent on social interactions, pair bonding. Males were taking care of the babies. There was babysitting. When we got the ability to measure oxytocin in them, it turned out to be four to 10 times higher than rats and mice. And they have, thanks to Steve's work and Angela Grippo, who was our shared postdoc, we now know they have a human-like autonomic nervous system with very high levels of vagal activity. So we have, at last, a model for some of these things that people are interested in, constructs like compassion that really don't make much sense in rats and mice. There are elements there, but they're not, they're not good enough. And the parasympathetic activity, vagal activity, is at the heart of how we regulate emotion and how it can help us out. So oxytocin has been shown to be involved in all of those things, rather than taking time to go through them. Engagement, sexual behavior, maternal behavior specifically, but also male parental behavior and alloparenting. Oxytocin is released, it is indeed released under conditions that involve positive social interactions, but it's hard to catch it. It's coming very quickly. It's also released, and it's easier to see it when things are, are stressful or 
bad. And it may serve as a component of a coping strategy and buffer against the stressors. Oxytocin then, the easiest way to see high levels of oxytocin in our animal models, and to some, that's a little hint of this in humans, it's not as, exactly the same, is social challenges, forced restraint, immune challenge, LPS, uh, chronic social isolation, but only in females, and it serves as a component of an adaptive coping strategy, buffering against these stressors with effects that in some cases differ between males and females, which we haven't talked about here much, but that's a complicated story. I'm going to take, how much time do I have? Okay, great, perfect. I'm going to take the last few minutes just to give you some data. I, I'm very um, insecure if I don't have data to show, so I can't just tell you stuff. You, you know, I don't make any of this up, but I always like a little data. And the story I want to tell you is one that we just published about two months ago in a Journal of Neuroendocrinology, at least parts of it, and that is that what happens if you give a naive male prairie voles, never seen a baby since he was one, a baby, an infant? Now, this is predicated on the notion, which has been shown in several species, that oxytocin can facilitate parental behavior. And this is data that Karen Bales collected when she was working with me. Karen's now at Davis. And we found, indeed, high levels of parental behavior when animals are given oxytocin and lower levels of attack behaviors. But the male was a kind of a mystery, and people had been saying that, that oxytocin was not involved in male social behavior, but I think it certainly is. Exposure to an infant can release oxytocin um, in males, not in females. I'll show you in a second. You present the male with a pup. He, he, almost all of them go immediately and start to take care of the baby. They're, they'll pick the baby up very gently in their mouth. They'll even comb their hair. They're going through like this whole complex behavior. Um, and even young animals, if given a baby, will do this. Animals that are just out of weaning themselves, which is a natural piece of the behavior of these animals called alloparenting. Here's some of the data from one replication. We've replicated this more than once. After, within 15 minutes after the baby was present, the oxytocin was high. Within 45 minutes, we didn't see this again, and we would never saw it in females. Now, if we gave a baby, the baby was like a hormonal treatment, and the animals pair bonded faster. And these were very strong data. We replicated this several times, and that's in the paper I mentioned that's just published. So animals that were given a baby showed a pair bond in response to a, a, or a partner preference in response to a very short period of exposure to a partner. Also, one of the features of oxytocin that I'm going to just drop here in a, as a side note is that oxytocin seems to have the ability to increase its own synthesis when we give it from outside. And that's some of these data from Angela Grippo, also in a paper in the journal Stress in 2012. And we have data now that suggest, and I, I don't know if this is going to hold up, but it's long been known that oxytocin has a feed-forward effect. And it looks like when you give oxytocin, then more is released and then over time more produced. So what is oxytocin? It's a physiological metaphor for safety, I think, maybe has a capacity to amplify its own effects and its own release, feeding forward. Um, it is a component, as I've said, of this very complex interactive system with feedback loops and effects throughout the body. And I think it may allow us to shift from states compatible with, allowing the expression of compassion to end healing from states that might not be so good for that. Um, it's a very important peptide. It's not just important in women. It's important in both sexes. It's there uh, during development. And I've worked most of the last 10 years on the developmental effects of oxytocin. And a single treatment can have lifelong effects. And we've even shown epigenetic changes with a collaborator, Jessica Conley. We've shown that methylation has changed in the oxytocin receptor itself, which is very important. But what oxytocin is not is it's not a substitute for compassion or love. It's not, we don't have love in a bottle. It's not well understood or, or studied in humans. I don't think it should be treated casually because of preliminary data that we have on epigenetic effects and because we don't know anything about it 
how long it takes to work, how, how, whether or not you get, you don't get addictions to oxytocin, but you may get a downregulation of its own system if it's repeatedly used from outside. And of course, the fact that it's part of the immune system, to me, means that we have to be really cautious in playing with it. I do think that by understanding oxytocin, we're going to get just a whole new lens on social behavior, mammalian sociality, the social nervous system, a deeper idea of human emotion, things like compassion that contribute to human well-being and health. I think that a lot of these do translate into a sense of safety, and that concept may be permissive, not causal, but permissive for compassion which is at the heart of loving relationships and most successful therapies of all kinds. A perceived sense of safety is necessary to allow the body to grow, heal, and restore itself in the face of the stress of life. Oxytocin plays a critical role in this, and as I've said, allows the, the benefits of compassion to emerge. So my last words here are, is the expression of compassion good medicine? And so, if so, how does it work? Well, of course it is good medicine. Does science have all the answers? No, we don't, wish we did. But we have a new way of looking at these problems, and it helps us to ask, I think, new and potentially important questions. So I thank you very much for your time.